Okay, good afternoon all. Um, welcome back to the uh, new Miss hashtag T500 conference. Um, it's an absolute pleasure of mine as a healthcare analyst at Numis to have the founder and CEO of Alsto Medical with us in this session. Um, Billy has been a, a friend for, for several years and to see the work that he's done um, at Alstone has been uh, a very uh, uh, impressive sight to behold. Um, Billy, if you were sort of able to describe the journey, I think we first met and Alstone was a defence business. That's um, yeah. And since then you've transitioned to medical. Um, I was hoping you could sort of elaborate part of the story. Um, I mean, how does a defense business uh, kind of pivot into healthcare? Um, some of the challenges that you may have had along the way and I suppose where you see the technology uh, kind of going, uh, the opportunity um, would be kind of appreciated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today the core technology we're working on is called breath biopsy. So it's looking at chemical markers on the breath, some of which are biomarkers in everything from cancer to infectious disease and inflammatory disease. So one of the key underpinning technologies we developed was a chemical sensor on a silicon chip. And what makes it special is you can program what you want to sniff just by changing the software. So it's a reprogrammable device. Mm -hmm. So this is something that me and two other researchers developed back in Cambridge University. And we spun Owlstone out in 2004 and as you say, the original focus was security applications. Yeah. So this is detection of toxic gases, explosives, those types of things. Yeah. So over the years, quite a lot of funding came in from the likes of uh, Department of Defense, US investors, which allowed us to mature the sensor technology, build it into products, which we have deployed globally, and build Alstone into a profitable business. But because of this reprogrammability aspect, we always had in mind, can we use this in medical diagnostic applications? So can we use chemicals in breath to help diagnose disease? It's obviously a really different business. Yes. So you know, in terms of funding requirements, what the exit is going to be. Mm -hmm. So we decided to spin Alston Medical out as a completely separate entity a couple of years ago. So some of the challenges there, we're trying to think about, well, what do we need to be successful in the future? Mm -hmm. So we spent a long time thinking about you know, who you bring across from the team, making sure all the IP came across. So thinking about those elements at the outset that would guarantee success down the line mm -hmm. at uh, IPO. And then since uh, spinning out, we've raised about 30 uh, $38.5 million of investment. Uh, and a big focus for us has been on how you adapt the technology for these diagnostic applications, but crucially how you get the right people in. Mm -hmm. So coming from that uh, more security military focus, we had the right people for that business. So we needed to you know, build out on the technical core and add in disciplines that we didn't have experience of, yes. of like regulatory compliance, reimbursement. So we've been able to do that over the last two years of growing the business. Okay. Um, in terms of the... Uh, the broader kind of applicability for breath biopsy. Um, how do you uh, see the, 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 the different sort of continuity of opportunity for breath biopsy? I mean, who, who needs the breath biopsy? Um, so when we look on breath, there's thousands of chemicals there, mm -hmm. and they can be used to answer a lot of different questions. I think what's really exciting, what we're trying to do as a business, is establish breath as a new diagnostic category that sits alongside and complements what you can do in blood and urine-based analysis. As a business, we want to create that category, but we obviously want to own it as well. So we're developing all the hardware, setting up breath biopsy labs, running large-scale clinical trials that gets us data sets, which is allowing us to control all the key aspects of the value chain in this new industry. So within this, you're also trying to figure out, well, where are the best opportunities to monetize in the near term and develop tests for the longer term as well? So we see two broad classes of application. First is in precision medicine. So how can you match the right patient to the right drugs? Uh, big focus there is in respiratory disease, yes. where you have expensive biologics and a lot of people don't respond how you can best identify those responders and non-responders. So we work with pharmaceutical partners there, so we've won contracts from like the GSK and AstraZeneca uh, to try and answer that precision medicine question. And then the other big uh, strand of what we're looking at is early detection in cancer. We know if you can pick up cancer in early stage, survival chances are about 10 times better and treatment costs are 10 mm -hmm. times lower. So we're running a 4,000 patient uh, lung cancer trial at the moment to take the breath biopsy technology 
identify these chemical markers of lung cancer with a view to then launching uh, that test, which we will market and sell ourselves. Okay, and in terms of the, uh, the early detection, um, I mean, how soon may you have a test ready that's, that's on the market and, uh, uh, and being used uh, to, to help patients? So I think early detection is one of the hardest problems to try and crack. And actually, if you look in you know, types of tests that people tried to develop before, there's very few successes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that being said, there's tremendous opportunity. When you look at the uh, overall numbers of patients who should be screened, so if you take at-risk categories, for instance, in colorectal cancer, it's about 950 million people who should be screened annual, or every three years, and a single digit percentage is on a global basis who are actually screened. Similarly, within lung cancer in China, you have an ever smoker population of 390 million people. Mortality rate for lung cancers, you know, increased 464% over the last 30 years. So we need to have better ways to pick up uh, cancer sooner. So obviously you need to run these large scale clinical trials like Lucid in order to get high quality clinical evidence that allows you to get the tests uh, onto the marketplace. So for us, we're trying to unpick different problems. So we're trying to think about, okay, in lung cancer, there's a challenge of if you have a suspicious finding, is that a cancer or not? Mm -hmm. So trying to launch tests there. Uh, while then building out uh, the pipeline for the early cancer detection, which inherently is a, is a longer uh, road, requires more investment, mm -hmm. but you know, fundamentally is worth it, both from a patient perspective, but also from a business perspective. You know, if we can do what some of the successful businesses like Exact Sciences yes. have been able to do, then I think we'll be in a good position from a commercial standpoint. Because we find it difficult from the kind of research perspective, if you're kind of looking around at kind of potential um, winners, um, talking through a five to 10 year view, mm -hmm. you see tens of billions of dollars going into developing drugs um, to kind of treat a range of cancers. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't seem this sort of no shortage of capital effectively for that. But when you kind of listen to the rhetoric that's coming out of sort of drug pricing's too high, pharmaceutical um, returns on their R&D investment are effectively too low, mm. and it, it kind of suggests to us more targeted drugs um, that are developed quicker um, and that work on sort of more effectively and, and safe as what's needed. And, and that's where I think the personalized mm. medicine mm. Um, and also from a healthcare pay, you want to kind of detect earlier. Mm. So is there an issue that too much capital is going into the therapeutics and perhaps not enough into the earlier diagnosis or personalized medicine? Or is some of the macro kind of dynamics sort of changing um, the desire? Because we see tens of billion, tens of millions going into um, a range of uh, other technologies, mm -hmm. hundreds if not billions going into liquid biopsy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. how does breath kind of position itself alongside a new wave of therapies mm. and a need for earlier diagnosis and uh, the competition with other means of, of mm. diagnosing kind of diseases? Yeah, so I, th I, I think definitely we need to be focused a lot more on early detection. Yes. But it's interesting to think, well, who are the beneficiaries there? So it's obviously the patients because mm -hmm. you know, their survival chances are 10 times better, but it's mm -hmm. the payers mm -hmm. as well. So you know, the reality is if you pick up a stage one cancer, you can use a way to cure that's been around for 100 years, which is cut it out of them. So resection works. Mm -hmm. You need to pick it up at an yes. early stage. Uh, so it's not the drug companies that will benefit from early detection. Mm -hmm. So that's why we were so happy to get investment from the likes of Aviva, for instance. So there they see you know, the, the key economic benefit from their standpoint of why it matters to pick up yeah. uh, a disease sooner. Uh, and that's, you know, again, why I think a lot of capital is starting to flow in you know, with liquid biopsy uh, being uh, an approach mm -hmm. where you can start to think, okay, well, can you find circulating tumor DNA for an early stage cancer? Yes. So I think the, 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 the massive positive that I see is the amount of capital going in to solve the problem. Yeah. Because the way I say it is, someone has to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, we think we'll be part of the solution, but it is something that just needs to happen. So I think capital is the enabler there for the right mix of solutions yeah. to come out. 
I think one of the uh, the challenges that we see in liquid biops is if you're thinking about an early stage cancer where you don't have a lot of circulating tumor DNA, then it's less likely to be sensitive in early mm -hmm. stage cancer won't pick it up uh, yeah. as much. And that's why people are starting to introduce you know, downstream markers yeah. uh, as well. Um, and I think where we see the advantages that breath potentially has is, you know, we've known for a long time that cancer has an altered metabolism, even in an early stage. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at on breath is a mix of these endogenous metabolites related to disease states, as well as mm -hmm. exogenous compounds, which you want to ignore in that instance. So I think there are, there's, you know, good evidence that the biomarkers will be there at early stage yeah. disease. And the other really unique aspect of breath is that with each exhalation, we can trap, store, pre-concentrate, and enrich all the chemicals coming out in breath. Yep. And most of them are coming from blood, which makes sense. You exchange chemicals from blood to the airway all the time. So through a patient breathing normally for a few minutes, you have the ability to enrich these biomarkers. So you so can't do that with blood. You can't take all the blood from your body yeah. to go find a biomarker, but with breath, you just sample for longer. Okay, so how would this work? Um, we are kind of putting this kind of up against our mouth. We're breathing back and forth. So perhaps you could just talk uh, some of our viewers through the, the components that go into your uh, Let's technology. Strap, strap it out. I don't, yeah, don't think uh, it's big enough yeah. for my nose. <laughs> I think I need the, uh, the larger. <laughs> so I think a, a key element that we see is, you know, how do you uh, democratize the collection of sample and how mm. you start to distribute tests uh, more widely? So the great thing about breath is that you can collect it in uh, uh, settings, not just clinical settings, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, GP pharmacy type settings uh, as well. So basically, a patient will wear this as, as they're breathing, so just normal tidal breathing, so it's very comfortable for yeah. them. They don't need to do any forced exhalation or anything like that. Uh, we have sensors in here that watch the breath profile. So you can say for the breath profile, which is enriched chemicals coming from the blood, you can then activate pumps that uh, will select that breath fraction, draw the breath down into this breath biopsy cartridge, yeah. And this is a bit like a sponge. So the yep. chemicals go in there and everything sticks yes. in that sponge. So then this cartridge pops out, sent back to our lab for analysis. So from the patient perspective, it's very, very comfortable. We mm -hmm. see in our trials, some patients actually fall asleep when they're collecting okay. the sample, which, you know, if you've ever had blood tests, it's yes. not that easy to fall asleep no. during a blood test. <laughs> Must be good for sort of patient compliance as well. I mean, people don't like going in for blood tests. Um, patient uh, adherence to a range of other cancer diagnostics is probably quite low. So an easier route in to then stratify for the more invasive tests also has to have a yeah. huge benefit. I, and that's for, why we kind of see it actually. So you know, no single test is you know, the be all and end all. It's yeah. thinking about what's the overall diagnostic pathway and how you can take a multimodal approach. So mm -hmm. compliance matters a lot. And actually we were taking a bit of a engineering system view of the problem because that was you know, what we did yeah. at Cambridge. Uh, and saying, so, you know, in colorectal cancer screening, for instance, you know, with fecal based tests, colonoscopy, compliance is a big issue. So you have about 50% of patients yeah. that just don't want to show up for mm -hmm. the test. So if you can uh, have modalities such as breath that have higher acceptability, mm -hmm you know, lower price points can be distributed more widely where you're uh, collecting the sample. If you see suspicion mm -hmm. of cancer, then you can funnel them down to, you know, more invasive or more expensive tests. So it's really part of this overall continuum of how do you identify those mm -hmm. at highest risk and fundamentally try and pick up a higher fraction of early stage disease. Yep. And I think a fascinating insight that you've provided us um, at the conference today has been around the use of um, exogenous compounds to, uh, to give a more potent marker of the liver metabolism and whether a drug is actually safe for a patient. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been a huge reveal to our investors today that the technology yeah. has application there. So yeah. I wonder to what extent that can become one of the, the key kind of pillars of Alstone's growth. I think you hit on a key principle, which is the scope of application mm. of breath biopsy here. And for us, we're always trying to find the intersection of you know, what's technically feasible with you know, what is the, the, the commercial, what can we turn this into commercially? Yeah. So again, if you think about early cancer detection, it's very challenging, but success there uh, can be a very meaningful uh, success. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we're already selling uh, research services to our pharma partners around precision medicine side of the things. Uh, and looping back and thinking about the sources of the chemicals in breath. So you have these mm -hmm. endogenous compounds, what you might look for in early cancer, uh, but you have exogenous compounds. So that is stuff that goes into the body and comes out again. Yep. So that can be things like drugs that you're yes. giving patients. So one of the challenges that we've seen is that you know, how you metabolize a drug is different from how I mm -hmm. metabolize a drug. And for certain drugs that have a narrow therapeutic index, uh, if you are too high, you can have toxicity effects. Mm -hmm. and if you're too low, you have um, uh, inefficacy uh, issues. Uh, and you know, pharmacogenomics is trying to make some inroads there mm -hmm. of saying, well, your genotype suggests that you will metabolize in this way. But the problem is your phenotype, how you actually metabolize, changes because of a huge amount of environmental factors. Other drugs you take, you know, your diet, you know, if you drink grapefruit juice, juice yeah. you, know, you will change your phenotype. So what we're able to do with breath biopsy uh, is use a, a technique we've developed called evoke probes. Mm -hmm. So exogenous VOC probes, which are a mix of uh, compounds which are metabolized the same way as drugs. So metabolized by the same enzymes, but they're completely uh, harmless uh, and on the generally recognized as safe list. So this means that you can give someone an evoke probe uh, it will be metabolized by a specific enzyme. And then in breath, because it's volatile, you just watch how the concentration changes over time, mm -hmm. which is acceptable for a yeah. patient because you're blown into this, not doing blood draws. Uh, and depending on what that profile looks like, it can say you're a fast metabolizer mm -hmm. uh, compared to how I metabolize, and that can then guide choice and dose for drugs. Excellent. Well, Billy, thank you for your Thanks time. So. And uh, to our listeners that are still with us, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have uh, Billy from Alstone. Um, you've seen a brilliant technology that's been spun out of Cambridge University. It's got applications in early detection, personalized medicine, um, and as a research tool, I think the advances that the company has made with the standardization of the, of, of the breath as a biopsy um, capability has been outstanding and it's going to be an absolute pleasure to watch the company's progress over the next uh, few years um, and see a real UK champion emerge um, in this field. So thank you. Thank you, Billy.